Welcome to Straight from the Gavel. I'm your host, Dave Barber. Each and every week at this time, we like to visit with a member of the General Assembly and discuss some of the things that are going on here at the State House and find out how it might affect you, the Rhode Island citizen. And it gives us a great deal of pleasure to welcome a gentleman who has appeared with us before on Capitol Television. He represents Narragansett in South Kingstown. It is my pleasure to welcome Chairman David Caprio. Chairman, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Dave. You know, I, I mention, uh, I address you as chairman because when the new speaker, uh, Gordon Fox, took over in February, he assembled his own leadership team mm -hmm. and appointed you chair of the uh, House Judiciary uh, committee. You have to be pretty proud of that, and it's also a pretty important committee. It's a very busy committee. Um, I had been serving on the Finance Committee and, you know, with a lot of work there, and uh, the uh, new speaker asked me if I would chair the Judiciary Committee, as you mentioned, and I had served on the Judiciary Committee in previous years and really got a flavor for the type of issues that they handle and the type of um, uh, responsibilities that are in, entailed with that and I was very excited to, to take on that task and uh, had a very busy year at that with some great success also. And, and of course it's a natural I mean you're a practicing lawyer and, and you have a, uh, a significant background in the law. How, lo how long have you been practicing law? Oh since 94 so that's 16, 17 years now. Yeah, that, that, that certainly qualifies yeah. you. Let, let's uh, explain a little bit more in detail the different types of bills that you deal with at the judiciary level. You mentioned that it is a, uh, a busy committee, and yes. it certainly is. W what are the types of things? Give our viewers an idea of the types of things you work with. We, we deal with uh, a lot of the bills that get sent to the judiciary committee deal with the cr criminal laws and a lot of, a lot of the laws that, uh, that, de that the courts deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, drunk driving laws, um, um, child predator laws, uh, spousal, family, um, domestic abuse laws, some very uh, significant topics and very controversial topics also. We do marriage equality and we do, um, you know, the abortion laws and, and, and those type of issues. So uh, there's quite an array of, of individuals that come to uh, testify and sometimes it gets quite heated as there are people that feel very passionately on either side of most of those issues. Well, you, you know, it's interesting that you say that because although you often hold lengthy meetings and hearings. One thing about the House Judiciary Committee, it's certainly not boring uh, because of the fact that you do deal with so many controversial issues. Yes. And, and we try to keep the decorum uh, as professional as, as possible with the understanding that there is quite amount of, of uh, strong feelings with regard to some of the issues that we take. Notwithstanding that, we are very uh, proud that oftentimes we are able to bring the parties together and come up with legislation that everybody can live with and everybody can support. And we've done that, uh, we, we were able to do that this year. And tempers sometimes run a little high and people are passionate about how they feel when they appear uh, before you uh, at the uh, House Judiciary Committee. How much pressure is sometimes applied by special interest. How, how is that to deal with and um, characterize it for our viewers? Well, when I became chairman, I, I never realized how many very close friends I had here in the building. <laughs> uh, you become, uh, you know, a lot of hands get thrown in your, in your face, you know, people, and they love to call you chairman. You don't let that go to your head. Um, the special interests here, the, some of the lobbyists, um, do a very good job at what they do. And what they, what they do is try to get their legislation passed. Mm -hmm. um, but they, are very, they can be very forceful uh, in their approach sometimes. And they really have different mechanisms in trying to make us understand why their viewpoint should be pursued. And um, most of them, I would say, do a very professional job and, and understand the, uh, the mechanisms of government. Uh, some of them, uh, sometimes go a little overboard, but that's our job to, uh, to keep them in check, I guess. You, you know, I know that since you've taken over this role, you have granted additional access to Capital TV uh, in covering uh, many of your, your hearings. Mm -hmm. And as we both stated, uh, some of them can go uh, very late at night. Now, I'm wondering, uh, certainly we appreciate that, and, and we like to have the transparency and show the citizens of Rhode Island what's going on in your committee, but I'm just wondering, did you take on this posture because of your father's TV show, Caught in Providence? Now, I'm a big fan of Judge Caprio's uh, weekend television show. I, I, I mean, are you trying to maybe follow a little bit in his footsteps? Not at all. Actually, <laughs> it's, it's a good question because 
A lot of what happens in this building is a mystery to the general public. It's a difficult building to visit, and although many people do come and testify on legislation, the, you know, the masses of, the mass of Rhode Island doesn't. And like we said, a lot of the issues that the Judiciary Committee takes up are very important and very, uh, you know, there's a high public interest in many of these issues. So by putting the committee meetings on television, it allows the public to see act the, how the process actually happens. They can, and it's amazing how many people would come up to me as I'm, you know, walking around, or whether it's in the supermarket or coming out of church or whatnot, and describe to me things that happened in my committee that they saw on television, whether they agreed with somebody who testified or disagreed and, and, and with some of the hearings. So it really, to credit to Capital TV, uh, to, to put it on television, it gives the public a really good uh, insight as to what we do. And it's not a nine-second soundbite. Uh, they see it unedited. They see it in its ent entirety. And I wasn't joking. I really am a, a big fan of uh, your father's show. I don't know how that came about, uh, how he started doing that. But again, you, you talk about awareness and just making people a little more familiar how the courts work. You get to go inside his courtroom and hear him deal with the general public on a myriad of issues. And he's such a very good communicator. Um, you have a very prominent Rhode Island family. Uh, a lot of high profile people um, are in your family. Of course, you serving here and now chairman of the House Judiciary. Uh, your father, the uh, judge, your um, brother, the state officer, the treasurer, now running for governor for uh, the state of, of Rhode Island. Obviously, there's a real commitment of public service in, uh, on the part of the Caprio family. We all enjoy what we do. And, you know, my, you call it a show, but what that really is is just a live broadcast or real-time broadcast of his court proceedings. There's very little editing at all. Um, so, like you say, people get a flavor as to what happens in the courts, and I'm uh, happy that uh, by televising the Judiciary Committee meetings that uh, the public gets a chance to see what we do here at the State House. The thing that amazes me about uh, the judge is that people that have served in the Judiciary, as long as he has, I found that over the years they tend to get kind of a jaundiced perspective and uh, maybe a little surly after dealing with what they have to deal with for so long, but he manages to keep such a uh, friendly uh, demeanor and uh, a warm uh, demeanor from the bench. I've, I've always been impressed by that and uh, I, I really uh, want to give him props, although I'm, I'm getting a little well, off the... Well, he raised five children, so we, we taught him patience early in life. <laughs> Yeah, that probably helped. Uh, speaking of children, uh, one of the things uh, that you were a sponsor of and a significant and important bill that was enacted into law uh, came out of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, this was legislation that closed a loophole um, in the law regarding furnishing uh, alcohol to minors. And uh, I know that's important to you, especially down in your area where you have a lot of underage college students and high school students that may be trying to, you know, um, break the law and consume alcohol. Tell our viewers about that. Well, it's an important issue, not only, you know, down in South County with, like you said, but also uh, where the other uh, colleges and universities are. In Rhode Island, statewide, it was not illegal for a minor to provide alcohol to minors. It was, as you said, it was a pretty gaping loophole. Everybody knows it's illegal for an adult to provide alcohol to a minor, not a minor to a minor. And, you know, there was some, uh, the, every year in the spring, we have these large parties that, uh, you know, the two or three hundred people in a, in a rental home uh, down in my area. And it's always a concern for the, for the residents and for the safety of everybody else on the roads uh, that a lot of this is going on. So we were able to, uh, to close that loophole this year and, and include Minus, minus providing alcohol to minors as, as now a, it's a civil penalty. So if a, if a high school senior shares his booze with another high school senior, that kid uh, is guilty of a crime. Right. The, the law is if between 18 and 21. There was actually a, a pretty um, lengthy debate on this on the, on the floor of the House. And then the Senate, uh, the Senate uh, changed the bill a little bit and, and made it a little less stringent. Uh, but we, we wanted to get something on the books, and it was a good place to start. And what's the penalty for, for a minor providing alcohol to another minor? It's a civil penalty, and I believe it's up to a $500 fine um, that would go through the traffic tribunal. Well, I, I, I could see why that is an important loophole that needed to be closed. You know, I frankly never thought of that. Um, you know, we always think of, when, when we hear of minors in possession, we just presume that it's an adult person that's providing the alcohol. Correct. When often, it, it, when often it's not. It, it, was a, it was a loophole in the social host uh, laws 
you know, and, and we've seen some tragedies, unfortunately, around Rhode Island where minors, uh, you know, get access to large quantities of alcohol and start sharing it with their friends. And unfortunately, it leads to uh, sometimes some very tragic events. And, and I know, too, the General Assembly in recent years, uh, they've also gotten more aggressive with uh, alcohol laws regarding boating. And, you know, it only stands to reason with tourism and recreation and our proximity to the water, uh, boating's very popular here. But that, uh, that boat can be a lethal weapon, too, if somebody's Certainly. operating under the influence. Certainly. Certainly. You know, alcohol needs to be, uh, you know, alcohol use needs to be, uh, you know, addressed in a very serious manner. And unfortunately, every year we see uh, tragedies uh, result from people who, who are not responsible with their alcohol intake. One of the uh, press conferences that we covered uh, not too very long ago uh, was a press conference that involved some legislation that you co-sponsored. And um, it was a little melancholy in that most people were pleased with the, the, the legislation happened, but the, the tragedy that brought this legislation to light was, was certainly uh, sad and tragic. It was the uh, Colin Foote Act. Um, tell our audience how that came about and what the legislation is all about. As you, as you mentioned, uh, it was a response to a horrific tragedy down in Charlestown where uh, Colin Foote um, you know, was on a motorcycle and his mom was behind him in, in a vehicle. The light turned green, he entered the intersection, and uh, another driver went through the red light and, and struck him and, and killed him right in front of his mother. And the, um, as tragic as that was, it was magnified by the fact that the person who hit him had had numerous, over 20 tra previous traffic infractions. And we saw that the traffic tri tribunal really didn't have the scope of authority that it needs. And Representative Kilmartin um, worked very diligently along with Senator Doyle on this bill, and I was you know, happy to be a sponsor with him. And we worked together to try to craft a law that's, that would um, give the traffic tribunal more authority to deal with re these repeat traffic offenders, who again place all of our safety in jeopardy by the way they um, operate on our roads. And, uh, I can't say enough to, as to the courage of the Foote family. Uh, Colin's dad, Robin, was up, at the state, up here in the State House days or a week after he, uh, you know, he lost his son to help us in crafting this law and, and try to show us what the, you know, how important this was. And he stayed through it and his family stayed through it the whole time uh, at, the, at the signing ceremony. It was a crowded room in the state room, and uh, Mrs. Foote gave a statement, and she was the strongest woman in the room that day. Everybody teared up, and she stood there and told us how important this was, not only to their family, but that it would be a lasting impression that her son would have on this state in a positive way. You, you know, nobody watching this broadcast right now, Chairman, could even fathom what she must have gone through, not just in the death of her son, sure. the tragic death of her son, but this car broadsides the motorcycle, and she's a witness to it. Sure. Um, I can't even begin. I, is, and I, I interviewed Mr. Foote, and I said, I'm not going to uh, suggest that I understand what you're going through. I can't. I can't wrap my arms around it uh, because it was so sad. And this kid really, by all indications, was a real good young man and had a pretty bright future. And, he was a superstar. And he was snuffed out in sure. just a second because of a person who's not a very good driver to begin with. Now they have the teeth that you can get the operator's license out of their hands, correct? You, you, prior to this, they could not revoke a driver's license at the traffic tribunal. The, the, best, the most they could do is suspend a license for a period of time. That was extended, and now they have the ability to actually revoke a license, and we put in some um, uh, prerequisites before they would be qualified to get a, their license back.